I would like to start out there with Madame Gandhi, if you can, to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, and we start from there. Sure. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kiran. I perform as Madame Gandhi. Uh, I often say I'm a drummer whose mission is to elevate and celebrate the female voice. I've toured drumming for MIA and for Kehlani and currently produce and perform my own music as Madame Gandhi. Okay. Melis? Uh, okay. Hello, this is Melis. I'm from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I work for she, she Said So Istanbul chapter as well with Sonar Festival Istanbul and for some booking agency, Charmenko. Uh, that's it. Okay. Alice. Hi, I'm Alice. I'm based in Manchester. I run a techno night called Meet Free um, with three other females, which was by coincidence, not design. Um, and recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, I started a night called Under One Roof, which is a rave for adults with learning disabilities. Hi, my name's Chloe Caillé. Uh, I'm from Paris, and I'm a DJ and a music producer. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Um, my name's Stephen Brains, and uh, the reason I'm on the panel today is I run a night called He, She, They with uh, Sophia, who's out in the audience here, which is a club night if you identify as a man, a woman, or also if you are agendered, gender non-conforming, trans, non-binary, etc. Hi, my name is Skin. I'm leasing of a rock band called Skunk and Nancy. Um, I'm also a DJ. I've been a little raver uh, when it all started <laughs> off uh, in castles uh, back in the day, uh, early 90s. Um, yeah, and it's a topic that I've, I, finally I feel like there's a word to describe me. <laughs> That's probably why I'm here. Perfect. So I want to start a bit, uh, each one of you, uh, the idea was to explain to you all how in our lives and our careers some of the discrimination or non-discrimination factors have been interfering with our growth. So I would like uh, to start at the end, if you don't mind, in order to, uh, for you to explain a bit what's your positioning in terms of the word intersectionality and how is your perception towards the, you know, the words that are most referred to that? Yeah, I love that question. Um, I think to start, intersectionality kind of came about as a word in the late 90s to qualify feminism that is beyond sort of white feminism, at least in the States, and to identify the fact that if you're a woman of color or if you're a queer woman, that affects your gender and that affects your positioning towards feminism and your access to privilege in a way that is not um, singular. It's multidimensional and, and it's intersectional. Um, I think for me personally, you know, in the music industry, there's a lot of conversation about how when journalists ask artists, what's it like to be a female drummer? What's it like to be a female producer? You know, instead of just like, tell me about your art. And, you know, for, for me personally, it's interesting because that question never quite bothered me the way it, it tends to bother many people. And the reason is because in my music, I lead with my feminism. My feminism is very core to the themes and the messaging of my music, and so it's an appropriate question to ask me. But it's not an appropriate question to ask a fellow female artist who might not be focused so much on their feminism as other themes in their work, which is equally valid. And so for us as people and as artists, it's really important for us to do the work of championing internally what it is that matters to us before going into spaces where they're gonna ask us. Because if we don't label ourselves and if we don't identify how we want to, the media and everybody else will do it for us and they'll get it wrong. And so for me, I definitely lead with my femaleness, I lead with my queerness, I lead with my South Asian-ness. You know, my family is Indian, my last name is Gandhi. And, and so then that allows folks to ask me questions that are appropriate for the work that I do. But I've definitely learned that the hard way, where people ask me about random things that may not be appropriate or applicable to my project. And so we have to de decide what is the, the right uh, identifiers before other people do. Yeah, and in a way I was, sorry, just a question of like, uh, you have such a big name, you know? <laughs> By say Gandhi, you're like, you're already, you know, there's a lot of things like we said, place, uh, where you come from, how you, what's your name and how you, you know, move around that kind of define what you are. And um, in this case, uh, Melis, we were, uh, sorry, Melis, we were talking about what you do in Istanbul since four years ago. Um, I'm part of a group called Queer Waves. Uh, it's a collective uh, who 
throwing parties for LGBTI community and organizing events for affordable and also which has direct contact with lots of um, alternative groups that we provide space, safe space for them to be there against all the ban and all the oppression from the government. Uh, since four years, this was like, it's a form of resistance for us that we say we are here and we keep partying, we keep being on the streets, we keep being on the venues and we don't stop. That's very good, especially in Turkey. The situation, as you said before, you had to ask for a visa to come to Yes, Ibiza. I'm the only one in this panel, I guess, who applied to visa to come here. So, yeah, Which is literally, what, two from. hours flight. <laughs> Anyway, Alice, uh, tell us a bit more about what you do because it's relevant for the community. We're talking about disability. That's another factor into intersectionality. Uh, yeah, for me, so when I started Meet Free, um, like I said, it was, it was for females, but that wasn't... And I know, obviously, there was an unconscious decision by us to call it Meet Free, which was a little bit of a play on the fact that we're females. It was kind of just a joke, but even though we don't like talking about the fact that we're female DJs, the fact that we picked that name obviously shows that there is that unconscious identity issue as well. Um, and we started the night um, really in a bid to kind of democratize dance floors. At that time in Manchester, we felt that the techno scene was very macho, it was very moody, um, and it was, quite, um, it was quite exclusive. So we started our nights doing pay what you want so that people could come for free. They could pay five pounds, they could pay 10 pounds, they could pay 20, and sometimes people did. Um, but it was more about um, kind of opening the door and saying, look, everyone's welcome. We also did things like glitter and inflatables, and they're a cliche, but they were intended to sort of disarm people and to juxtapose against the like banging, like 145 BPM music that was happening at the same time, so that people felt um, more comfortable and they could feel sort of part of something. And from that, we kind of enjoyed pretty good success. And after a few years, I sort of thought, well, we've got a little bit of a platform. It would be really nice to give something back, to do something else, and thought about it in terms of like you know charity or what else. And then I thought, well, what what is the ethos of this night? It is the democracy of dance floors. It is opening up to more people. So um, with no background in working with the disabled community myself, um, I approached a local um, self advocacy group and said, look, would you be up for kind of helping me out with this in terms of what's the right way to approach it, what are the right things to do. And it kind of just went from there. Um, and it, it was amazing to me because we talk about these kind of levels of identity that make up those sections. So whether it's gender, whether it's race, um, you know, as a female, okay, you do have that bit of a barrier. I'm white, middle class, so I've got those big privileges, but being able-bodied was not something that I ever before consciously identified as, and I didn't realize that that was a privilege because again, we talked before about visibility. It wasn't really visible to me. So when I started Under One Roof, I was pretty shocked at how much further it went past just, uh, you know, wheelchair accessibility. So I had people that came to the night that said, oh, you know, we did go to a pub or a club before, but people made fun of us, or I tried to get in, but because of my mannerisms, the door staff weren't accustomed to that, so thought I was on drugs or thought I was drunk, so couldn't get in. So for me, um, it has been my own kind of journey to understand what these levels and dimensions are. And I think dance music in general, it's quite, it's, it's moved on from that kind of underground scene. It's quite shiny now, it's quite elite. It's quite one dimensional. And I think it's really good that we're having this conversation because we need to realize that, you know, DJ, DJ booth, okay, that's one dimension, but the crowd is a whole, tapestry and kaleidoscope of different people with different needs um, and different wants and different identities. And one, com one thing that is coming out already from the three of you is the factor of money that is being cheap and affordable and reachable for everybody, which I think it's uh, also a factor that is like, you know, economic resources to kind of do you access that. So, um, Chloe, do you want to talk about it? I'm sure. I think, you know, privilege is something that not many people have in the world and money is definitely an access that allows you to attend events, go to parties, pay for raves and as soon as the prices of ticketing is too high, well that automatically eliminates a whole group of people that can't go. Um, and I think that coming to what you're saying about making it accessible to as many people as possible, 
is very important because access allows people to see and be a part of the things that we are all doing. Um, and I think as you know, a female DJ here, it's been a very interesting journey over the past few years of kind of seeing where I position myself today in a group of predominantly male um, environments, but also feeling empowered by my peers that believe in me, that want me to grow, and that kind of see me as, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm different because I'm a female, but most of the time today, I do feel like there's an awareness that's being, that's growing. Um, but it's definitely, you know, a topic that needs to be addressed because I think, you know, the access and the ability to go to these events and see what is happening is something that um, I think globally needs to be a lot bigger and a lot more, you know, that, you know, you talk about the accessibility of being able to go, you know, with disabilities, like there are so many people that aren't even able to walk into a nightclub, you know, and that's something that if you can't actually go and see music and see what's happening, how are we all meant to engage and grow in that way? Steven, uh, what do you think you're, you're, uh, you've been able to give out while you're organizing your nights? And what do you think is the result of it towards yourself more than not only the audience attending? All right. So just, just to put it in a dance context, because most people work in dance music here. So, f so if you go to a straight club, as it were, like predominantly straight club. There's normally three white male DJs and women uh, podium dancers. If you go to a gay club, typically, I, I'm queer myself, it's normally three men who are white DJing and men with six packs dancing. So in no place, either in the predominantly straight or the queer space, if you're a woman, are you being like, oh, cool, this is for you? And like, if you're a black queer woman, mm -mm, like, no, I'm, oh, I'm not the DJ. Oh, no, I'm not the dancer. Oh, oh, I'll just go somewhere else, <laughs> thanks. And then it's really weird because, we, so we run this night, he, she, they, and it's to look at gender, not just as a male and female issue, and not look at race as just a white, black issue. It's like, well, what about people who are Chinese or Indian or Turkish or like, or not treat black people as one homogenized group because it's a different experience if you're dark skinned, if you're light skinned with the colorism debate, all these different things. So it's, it's not ever going like box ticky as like, oh shit, we haven't got a trans person this week, ah, whatever. <laughs> it's just making sure that over like doing parties in different places that over the course of time, there's a spread of talent from different places. Like, there might be some lineups that are more black, there might be some lineups that are more brown, there might be some lineups that are more white, there might be some lineups that are more non-binary. Some of the DJs might be older sometimes, sometimes they might be younger, because that's the other things, it's like ageism is a thing, ability is a thing. And to be honest, when we first started out, I didn't know like as many things or think about as many things or like like I come from a from a Roma um, population on my dad's side and white on my mum's side. So there's things like passability. So like you wouldn't necessarily look at me and go like, oh, you're from a gypsy thing. Or like I've got a broken nose and I used to be a little fighter boy. So you don't necessarily until I say like I love dick know that I'm queer. No, but it, it, I'm doing it to make you laugh and to engage in it because sometimes people get a bit scared about making mistakes or being it too serious. But like, because I'm not like super effeminate, I think I'm kind of more palatable to a lot of straight guys. Like, yeah, 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 I can watch mixed martial arts with you and like, like you know, I fancy women as well as men, so we can talk about girls and did it. So going into certain clubs. Like a straight club, I don't really have any problem. I don't, no one kind of gives me shit. No one calls me queer or a puffer or stuff like that. Well, actually, if I'm in, and this is interesting, if I'm in a queer space, you do know this is a gay club. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally, totally, yeah. Like, watch me destroy a cock. I know I'm queer. Like, I'm good. <laughs> Skin. But, but yeah. same thing if you, women with long hair as well, sometimes like, oh, this is, oh, you don't look. 
you don't look like a lesbian. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, so there's all these these daft things of stereotypes. A lot of times because of what media says, this is what we're allowing you to look like as a gay person. This is what, like, women must be super butch if you're gay. Men must be super effeminate. We're actually, we're all an interplay of loads of different things. Yeah, that's intersectionality, actually. And In, uh, Indeed. Before we were talking with uh, with Skin, and that's uh, I think the question for her is like uh, how you have been typified before, and uh, you know you said you know they normally said oh you typified as gay or black or you know how yeah you um, I mean I was raised in a nightclub because my granddad had this um, quite famous shabin at the time, um, and this shabin was because my granddad was Jamaican, and every, all the Jamaicans were never even allowed into nightclubs in London and Brixton. So black people just used to create their own clubs called Shabins, which was like an illegal kind of things going on, as we all know. Um, and then, you know, you know, cut to being in a rock band. Um, in the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s, um, I started up Skunk and Nancy. And so I was a black woman fronting a rock band um, who was also shaven-headed, which used to fuck some people up, you wouldn't believe that, um, and who's also gay. Um, and that was before it was cool, before it was, you know, enemy was like, oh, she's gay. And so every, every um, uh, interview about me used to start, start with le black Amazonian six-foot lead singer, bisexual lead singer of Skunk and Nancy. Every interview was the same thing. And I was like, who is this person? <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's really interesting to have this discussion about intersectionality in this day, because I'm so happy that we're getting there, because I'm, I remember doing interviews that people would say, oh, so um, which are you when you write your song? Which are you? Which is more important? Is it the fact that you're black, or is the fact that you're gay, or the fact that you're um, a woman? And my point was like, well, how am I supposed to separate myself like that, you know? You're, I'm writing perspectives as a person growing up in Brixton. Um, and, and it was actually very difficult in the early days because it was just so weird to have a black, bull-headed woman front in a rock band. So for me, I, I can really see how amazing it is to see how things have moved on. So now I f we finally have a word for it, which is intersectionality. Um, multicultural turned to diversity, and now it's turned into intersectionality, which is fantastic. Um, and I think it's about when you see um, somebody like me, it's not automatically thinking, oh, well, you know, she's going to be like R&B, she's going like, you know, to be into grime or whatever. <laughs> it's to kind of open it up, open up those rosters, open up the, um, the clubs, open up the perception of people who are going to be DJing or people who are going to be on a dance floor because, you know, I think we're a reflection of people that are raving. You know, in this room, we're a reflection of people that want to rave. Um, but you kind of find that there's all these little blocks because of um, people seeing you in one way and stereotyping you in one way. Um, in the, on the other side of it, though, um, once people got over the hurdle of me being a black female gay leasing of a rock band, which was just so weird, then it became the thing that sold the band. Then it became something that um, I used to, the exam to my advantage. Um, different countries had different issues. Yeah. Um, Japan had a major problem because I was shaving headed because they see a woman's, at that time, a woman's beauty was in their hair. So they were always, when I did front covers, they were always trying to get me to wear like a boy's collar, like a choir boy and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in other countries it was more, um, in England it was more because I was black. Definitely England had much, they, you know, they saw their right bands, their rock bands um, as being white guys, you know, um, what's the, I've forgotten the name of it, the, the kind of the scene at the time. Um, Britpop, that's it. Uh, <laughs> Easy Britpop. to forget. A Britpop was just, you know, England marketing to America for white guys in a band, you know, and we were outside of it, Skunk and Ants outside of it. So for me, I think it's really encouraging that we're having this discussion and that it is moving on. But I do think at the same time, we have to give people a little bit of a chance to get there because we're so social media, so quick to jump on anyone and, oh, you know, it's intersectionality, what the fuck is that? We don't understand that um, somebody was saying earlier that it's, you know, we have to do a bit of hand-holding at the same time and not be so quick to just jump down people's throats about it too. Yeah, we shared, um, and thank you, uh, we shared a, a kind of scheme of what the factors of intersectionality are 
there are 10, and we said education, sexuality, ability, age, gender, uh, ethnicity, culture, language, class, and race. Uh, I started my kind of brief to you all, uh, thinking, of course, that this is a very diverse panel, actually, and I think it, it's uh, even encouraging who we are, uh, except me, of course, privileged white woman, uh, 53, coming, working for Sonar, and since 26 years ago, and, you know, I was, like, feeling myself a bit guilty about it, because I was like, oh, I'm the mediator, but I actually have a lot of things that I in favor what is not in favor for me is age, but I wanted to discuss with you guys is what of these elements are the most relevant in your life right now that center your art and your way to go and to look into the future. Um, if I can jump in, I think one of the things I think is really relevant now is just um, finances and money. You know, I think the dance music scene is getting so fucking expensive for everybody. I used to come to Beef and you could get into any club, you know, in the mid-90s. You could get into clubs, it was cheap and... You know, because DJ's wages were smaller and, you know, people weren't so money-centered. And now we've seen, like, over the last 20 years, this massive explosion of techno. I think that more and more, especially the way that this island has been, like, it made a conscious... It seemed to me they made a conscious decision not to have, like, working-class people be able to, able to afford to get hotels and flights and clubs and drinks here. You know, I think that's been a major thing for, like, my nieces and nephews who want to come here, they're like, it's just too expensive for people now. And what about uh, you, Madame Gani, what about the US? Yeah. How do you relate to the scene you live oh. in LA? I, I love LA. <laughs> I have a good time in LA. I wanted to actually um, say something uh, that, you know, we were touching on earlier. And I think when the biggest pushback to this conversation the simplest pushback that I hear time and time again is very simple. People just say, I don't know about intersectionality. I don't know about diversity. I just book acts that are good. I just book the best. We just book acts that are good. This mentality is part of the poison. It's part of the problem. Because what we've been trained to perceive as good is a white dude with his laptop jacking off to himself while he takes an Instagram photo of himself in front of a sea of thousands of people. And I don't enjoy that as a consumer. So therefore, for me, that's not the best. Something different is, is the best. Something that looks different is the best. And so if we don't have bookers and talent agencies taking a chance on different types of acts that offer different things, that's why we get stuck with the same thing over and over again. And there's a business case for that for the reasons that many of my co-panelists already mentioned, is that you have a diverse array of people and consumers who have the money to spend, who want to come to these events, and they want to consume music that appeals to them, not just a certain very monolithic group of people. The other thing that I wanted to say about the diversity and inclusion comments is that many times bookers and festival DJs who are looking for this 50-50 or who are looking to be inclusive they think they're doing us the favor. But the irony of the whole thing is like, you would be so lucky to have queer folks in your space bringing some joyfulness to this very, as you said, moody club environment. You would be so lucky to have black folks dancing their ass off in the middle while the rest of the people are against the wall taking drugs. Like, you would be so fucking lucky. Does that make sense? So it's, it's not that they're, they're doing us the favor. It's that by creating something that is unique and different, not only do you have a business case, but you're making a product, a club, a party, a festival better. And just to be, yeah. just, just a second, just to be positive on this, I think that it's true that the booking agency and the talent managers and everybody that we all know, uh, of course it depends on the roasters. We have discussed about how you choose your roster, how you choose to have sell a certain amount of diversity or not selling it or being conscious that you don't want diversity in your roster. But at the same time, I think that is also a question of generation. And, you know, the, the generation, the music industry generation, uh, it's a different one, but the one that rules is still the same. So we, we are, I kind of teach and I see the kids and the kids, you know, most of the kids don't want to be promoters. They're scared as hell because it's too expensive. And I think, you know, when we started, uh, not, nobody was having a lot of money to start a party. You just do a party. You, you're born promoter. And I think there's a lot of, you know, we were discussing about education. Like, you know, most of you would die. Hmm. 
Skin, you wanted to say something. I just love what you said. Thank you. <laughs> That's fucking great. I think um, I wanted to, there was one more like thought thought in that scope as well in that framework that I would add which I'm like so honored to sit alongside these folks because the solution is also both and. It's like yes, we do want to program folks of different intersectional backgrounds into the mainstream festivals because they get the most eyes. So you have to fight power inside the system. But it's also the best when we just go and build our own. Because aspiring to the mainstream stuff implicitly validates it. It's saying that we want to be part of something that intentionally is excluding us. So it's sort of both and. Like, yes, we need to get into the spaces that have the most eyes and the most money. But also, we have to build our own shit with our own new rules yeah, so that's, that we can teach. Exactly. And that's to me, is what happened, especially in places like New York. You, there's a lot of, of parties that are much smaller, that are very kind of queer, non-binary, very open place. Lots of DJs, lots of rappers that are playing to like, you know, two, three, four, five hundred people, these smaller gigs. Um, and they are, for me, the inspiration. You know, they're the ones that are coming up with a different different style of music because, you know, I think dance music has to have fresh new things and fresh new ideas and fresh new inspirations coming into it. Or, you know, as we've seen over many years, you know, it does, you go through periods where it just gets really stale. Um, so I do think that's a, a very valid thing and a very exciting thing as well. Alice. Yeah, sorry, I just, just to touch on a couple of things. I think at the minute, um, we're in an era of kind of like an identity crisis like people are you know look at like brexit like me i've got an irish passport i live in the uk i'm a european you know i'm a, you know, people don't know what they are and i think to touch on what you said it's it's what people other people attribute your identity to you based on what you look like so you can be like a 50 year old white dude like driving your mercedes on your way to your office job and like listening to rap and like you know bitches and drugs or whatever, and then you get into your, your office job and it's like, okay, that's fine, I can deal, as we talked about previously in the green room, I can deal with that because like, that, that guy's black, he's a rapper, he fits in what I think a black person should do. If they then get to their office job and their boss is black, do they feel differently about it? And I think that the thing that people can deal with is like, okay, yeah, you look like something, you, you look like what I think you should look like, so, Female, you know, female DJs are always, you know, their looks are always what comes up. Um, and you almost get punished if you're, if look at the Nina Kravitz thing, like you get punished if you look good. But people are like, okay, yeah, I can deal with that because that's what I think you should look like. Or I think you look like that or you look gay, so I'm okay with that. But it's when, when you sort of challenge that with people. So I think that um, class and economics and disability, people don't really they're kind of scared of that and they don't really want to touch those things because it's not like someone identifies as poor, it's not like someone identifies as being in a wheelchair. And it's if people can't put you in that box and say, okay, well, I can do a gender split because I know who's male, I know who's female, that person looks right. Okay, I can, I can get some um, different races because yeah, they're meant to do that. But there's other issues that people just don't want to touch because yeah. they're not really sure what what to do with it or yeah. how to identify or how to compartmentalize those people. And I think that people can only do things in certain kind of steps. And, you know, I was, I was so shocked by, you know, what you said that people said, well, which is it? Like, which of these three things do you identify as? And it's like, you don't identify as those things. Those things are just who you are, but those are the terms, the terminology and the together. words yeah. that people are comfortable with using. I, I think, just to jump in, I think education is a real big part of this. I think... Over the last few years, there's been a lot of discussions that have arise, and a lot of people are very scared to jump in and speak out because they don't understand fully what this all means. And it's a big topic that's addressed all over the media, but it's a lot of big words, and people don't know what anything kind of is or stands in our fair and are, and are kind of scared to stand because they don't want to say something wrong. Um, so I think, I mean, I have six younger siblings, and they're so well read and they're, you know, in their schools, there's starting to be a lot of education around certain words, you know, what is the difference between a queer person, a trans person, a non-binary person? You know, what does this mean for certain people? How do you identify? What are these new groups? What does it mean to be a female DJ? There are female producers. Wow, this is really cool that we're seeing a change. Um, and I think that, you know, from all of the panelists here, you know, it's clear that there is a change, there's something moving forward, but I think education is kind of, you know, as role, as role models and as 
you know, people in this room that are forward thinking, I think it's important to speak out and educate those around you who might not understand and want to know more about things. Yeah, one thing that I wanted to ask Melis is, have you experienced censorship in Turkey? Censorship, like cultural censorship? Uh, of course. <laughs> what uh, kind of experience uh, do you have of it? Uh, as an LGBTI person, uh, and also recently for electronic music events, we had very hard time bringing other artists from outside because of fear. And also for diversity groups that we can provide space for them, that they can come to events and they can feel safe, they can be feel welcomed in Istanbul and all other cities. Uh, and, and in terms of, let's say, LGBTI events, uh, since three years, most of them are banned. Uh, you can't organize panels, workshops, and we can't organize pride parade in Istanbul, for example. Uh, we used to have lots of people are coming, like let's say, three, thirty thousand people walk like three years ago on Istiklal Street to support LGBTI rights. But I think the intersectionality can put in there because many people are were there. Uh, from different backgrounds, not just LGBTI. They are women, they are people of color, and they are from different class. They came to support us. Uh, even though this ban from the country, they, it's going on and still not good. Uh, we still throw parties and organize events, underground music events, some electronic ones, and we say we are here. It's, I bet they're I, the most fun ones as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of form of resistance for us, it's the music. The, First thing we are saying that we are here. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's very important to know also countries in which they're not as fortunate as we are to organize and promote things in free way, more or less. Um, can I say one thing about that? As, and I think it's really important for us to remember um, in this community that everything is political. I know it's one of my own lyrics. Um, and so what you're talking about is really political. And in terms of intersectionality, I think it's really important to give people a chance to get there and not shoot people down on social media when they say something wrong in part of this discussion. Because I think that um, as an industry, um, the dance music industry, you know, we tend to be more on the left wing side of it. And I think that we're, we're in this point in history where we're really being attacked by the rise of the right wing um, in many of our countries by the, right of, by the rise of people who are very against raving, very against LGP intersectionality, against diversity. So I think we also have to remember that we have to be positive to each other and be a bit gentle and be quite tolerant when we don't always understand and aren't getting there. Some people are getting there quicker or faster than others because, for instance, when I said to people I was doing a, a talk um, um, on intersectionality, most of my friends were like, what the fuck is that? I don't know what that is. What is that? You know, and in and, and that we can have, we can be quick to shoot each other's down. So I just think we have to also remember to be, just be really open about it and be really positive and give people a chance to get there because um, as a group, we really are being attacked. Yeah, we, we've been discussing about social media and the rays of fact that all these in social media are hashtag. And they're not real. They, yeah. They're like, you know, hashtag diversity, hashtag education, yeah, hashtag I mean, whatever. There, there's the Vox party now have an office in, Dal in, um, in Ibiza town. And the Vox are, are ultra white wing yeah. bunch of Nazis. How did they manage to get um, an office in, in Ibiza? We know one of the most open places. So I think we also have to remember that we have, this is really important. We have to be really open about it with each other, but stay together because there's people outside of us that really just want us dead. Alice? Yeah, I just, I think that political point is so important because, I mean, obviously some people experience it in more extreme forms than other, but, you know, parties are police wherever you go. And at the end of the day, as the right wing kind of rises, they, they don't want these groups of diverse people who have ideas and are different and have different backgrounds and want to do things. They don't want them to come together because then we'll be like in on the secret. If they can keep us all kind of homogenized, then we're going to be easier to control. So I think it's just really important for us all, like everyone here, to just keep putting on these parties, keep doing it, keep shouting and keep dancing yeah. essentially. There's a lot of money and power in the industry, in the beef and in the dance music industry. And I think that money and power, it'd be great if they came together to kick Vox out of Ibiza. 
Well, one of the things that we were discussing also is about, you know, the fact that we all come from different backgrounds. That allows the diversity we have. On the other thing, you know, we all come from countries in which the scare is there. It's, it's you know, there is a certain word that is called for that. It is fear. They are afraid. All of us. I mean, there's, there's a fear, real fear towards, you know, the reality of intersectionality in lots of ways. You know, and when fear reacts, you know, that's what my age has taught me, and it's all by cycle. So I live that, like, I don't know, 30 years ago, I come from Italy, Berlusconi time, he was Trump before Trump was Trump. So it's like, you know, politi politically speaking, there always be that kind of reaction against any kind of growth on diversity. But the thing is that we were discussing about the importance of the visibility of this diversity online, which sometimes is kind of fake, you said, which is true, is like completely superficial. And the need was a bit to transfer it into the real experience which you all represent, no? Yeah, um, I have a positive perspective on social media in, in one sense. Obviously, I agree with the negatives, but I think, you know, in this sort of fourth wave of feminism and intersectional feminism that we're in, I think that social media has allowed us to move people from the offline, I mean, so the online behind their phones and into the streets. You know, the 2017 Women's March was yeah. the largest single day march on the history of the planet because we were able to mobilize. You know, Black Lives Matter taught that to us. Black Lives Matter said, let's get everyone on the same page and then let's give them instructions and let's energize them. And I think that's a huge positive. I think the second benefit of social media was if you look at past movements, if you look at Riot Girl in the 90s, the women's rock movement, if you look at women trying to get the vote, those different groups had to rely on male journalists and media who oftentimes would spin their story for the negative and misrepresent what was actually happening. Women would go true. to try to get... Sorry. Very, yeah, very true. true. Yeah, you're like, from experience, <laughs> you absolutely this is know. true. Hell yeah. Whereas now we get to own the narrative. I get to post whatever is accurate on my own social media. You know, when I never mentioned this, but 2015, I ran the London Marathon. I ran the London Marathon bleeding freely on my cycle to combat all of the global period stigma that faces women and folks who bleed all around the world. And I wrote about this story on my blog, and the story went viral. And the story went viral because it was talking about how we do have to smash sort of this menstrual stigma that affects so many people. And while many journalists covered it in a very kind of, like, you know, bullshit kind of way, most folks had to cover it honestly because I wrote the story myself and the blog lived online. So if you were right, you quoted it directly from me and it was a very intelligent and thoughtful, radical act. And if you got it wrong, you were part of the problem. So I think those are the two ways that social media does amplify social justice causes in a very powerful and poignant way. On the other side, organization, it's important. Yes. I think that's why we, I mean, we part of She Said So, I think that you know, uh, the multi-fragmented reality of social media doesn't help, uh, helps get people in the street, but doesn't help get people uh, consciously working on it every day, True. Uh, which is something that we discussed before, and it's like, I think platforms are very important for that work. I mean, it's, it's a tool that you have to work out and use to your advantage, you know? Um, everything, any kind of new wave of technology, the information age that we're in now, there's going to be good ways and bad ways to, to use it. You know, we had the guy on Facebook that viewed himself going into a church and killing a bunch of people. You know, so there's, there's, there's ways, it's, it's how you use it. And I think that, you know, if you use it positively in the right way, you can be very successful by educa educa educating people about intersectionality. To say that it's not just one thing. I mean, um, you know, in London we have gay pride and then we have the black pride now because so many black people felt that they weren't represented in the main, mainstream gay pride. It was basically just white muscle men guys. So we created um, our own gay pride. Um, which is now the coolest gay pride, oh, yeah. as you know about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of one of the ways that social media can be positive. That's one of the ways that, as you were talking about, you know, people just get off their asses and do their own thing. If you can't see it there, go and make it happen yourself. Yeah. You know, we're not there with our begging bowls waiting for you to like, oh, please give us this, please give us that. We're just going to go and create it. We're going to go and make it. Um, and that's one of the things that happened with Black Pride. And it's, it's, it's an amazing event. So we are wrapping up, more or less, I think. We have like 45 minutes, more or less, less than that. Two questions from the audience. 
Stephen, please, I really need you to talk. So. Oh. <laughs> You've been quite quiet, so it would be lovely to hear. No, no, I haven't been kept quiet. I just, I, Thinking. I wanted to listen and learn. Yeah. Like, no, I, I was just going to say just, because some of, some of the points might sound a bit doom and gloomy, but on a positive way, and I think this has also been touched upon, because like, not in a creepy way, but I did used to have a picture of her on my wall <laughs> as a kid, Aww. growing up in a... So awesome. it, yeah, yeah, but I did, I did, like, I was a big rock fan. And, like, as much as intersectionality, we've, we've talked about all the adverse impact, like, like you know, I right, am white, but I'm Roma, so we're 1% of the, the UK population, but we're 5% of the prison population, so we're, like, five, five times over represented. Because, you know... For, for various reasons, but sometimes what I've found is, and, and same with skin sin, once you got over the, oh, I'm an outlier thing, oh, I don't fit this mold, or I don't fit that mold, with, with how people want me to be, like, because the more you deviate from the white male in a rock band thing, you actually turn the, sub, what could be seen as negatives, into your USP, that's your unique selling point, you have a voice that comes from a whole group of different things that nobody else has. And that was the genesis that started to get that of like, oh, actually, you're not the thing that shouldn't be here. You're, you've just owned the fucking space. I, mean, I think with, with me and my band, we just bypassed the journalists and it was the people that kind of still keep my band up there, you know, and it's not the, the, the media. Well, you also wrote fucking amazing songs and sang <laughs> them really well <laughs> and you! performed them really well. Wrapping up, it's two questions <laughs> from the audience. Sorry, guys. Wrapping up. Questions? I mean, it's a pretty wide topic. Here. Somebody? Hello. Uh, you mentioned politics a couple times. How important are politics to this discussion? And how important is it to continue to bring politics onto the dance floor? to facilitate and protect this discussion? Uh, for me, it's survival. Because if we don't bring politics onto the dance floor, if we don't bring politics into it and recognize um, that dance music is for everybody and people are all of us involved, you know, it, it's the right wing are very, 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 very organized mm. and very strong. And they are not like dominoes. Each country in Europe is having a stronger and stronger kind of right wing faction within, um, the, within that country. So I really feel like this is absolutely not the time to sit on the fucking fence, you know? This is not, you know, we can rave and we can party, we can all take drugs and get drunk, but we have to be aware that they're going to come for us because we are the open people. We are the people that are willing to have a discussion about intersectionality. And, and so I think it's vital at this moment in time. Um, you know, we've got Nigel Farage coming back with his Brexit party, European elections. It's, it's going to be really shocking to see how big the right wing are. So for me, it's like people you need to get off that fence and stand up and actually be on our side. And we all need to kind of be on each other's side on this. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think it's, I think it's hugely important to remember that politics and music have always gone hand in hand. Like the, the revolutions have always been side to side with music. Look at, you know, what disco did in New York in the 80s. Um, and I think one thing, again, to try and end on a positive note is when you think about all the industries that are out there, music is actually probably one of the ones that is doing best in these areas. It's probably a lot worse in science and accountancy and law and things like that. So we should be proud of what we're doing as well. And it's good that we're having these discussions. And I think rather than kind of beat ourselves down about it, is to remember that we're actually, we're, we're leading in these areas. So we need to keep Absolutely. doing that. We're moving, we're moving forward and they're trying to move us backwards. We need to keep pushing. My husband is a mechanical engineer. When he comes back home, he just gives me all these stories about nightmares in the working place. And, you know, that makes me feel very lucky. Yeah, we are getting a lot of things right. One more question? Yeah. It's over. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. You're a wonderful audience. Thank you to Madame Gandhi, Melis, Alice, Chloe, Stephen, and Skin.